All right, hello and welcome everybody to today's workshop. I think we're live. Everything should be uh, working as possible or work as it should be. So I wanna welcome you today to today's workshop. Uh, my name is Jason Hamilton. I'm the founder of Keep It Simple Financial Planning. And today we're gonna to follow up on last week's workshop where we're gonna discuss more about what a net worth statement is, what your cash flow uh, should possibly look like before going into retirement. And I'm also gonna spend some time answering any questions you may have about anything we talked about last week um, or anything we talk about today. So if you are one of the brave folks that uh, actually sat down, put together your um, your net flow, or excuse me, your net worth statement, uh, you spent the time to pull at least three months of bank statements, hopefully up to 12 months of bank statements of uh, all your spending for the last 12 months, and that could be either bank or credit card statements, and got everything all together and organized and categorized so that you know how much you've been spending uh, pre-retirement so that you can think about how much you are gonna possibly be spending post-retirement, then I wanna congratulate you. Uh, for many others, I'm sure you might have uh, just watched the workshop last week and didn't really do too much about it, uh, or maybe you got frozen along the way because you weren't sure what uh, a net, net worth statement should look like or what a cash flow statement should look like. So today we're gonna spend some time with you as well, getting you more comfortable with the concept of what it should look like. And I'm gonna show you an example um, and walk you through that so to give you something that you can work off of to uh, to work on your actual financial foundation. So uh, all of this subject is around financial integrity. And uh, part of this, if, if you've never done anything like this before, like prepared a net worth statement or a cash flow statement, uh, this may feel a bit overwhelming. But uh, you know what I want to encourage you to do is, you know, once you get this done the first time, you know, the second and third time, and then keeping track of things on an ongoing basis becomes much, much easier. Uh, but it does take a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of sweat equity up front to get these things in place. But once you do, I can promise you, you'll feel a lot better. Uh, you will have the confidence to know really where everything is at, how things are categorized, and really what your expenses are really going to be as you transition to this next stage. Um, most of the people I've, I've spoken to uh, really don't spend a lot of time doing budgets or doing cash flow statements or even putting together all of their net worth in a nice fancy spreadsheet. Uh, one, probably one in 20, uh, I guess, are kind of the personal finance, finance nerds that like to do all this kind of stuff, but most people don't like to do it. But what I want to emphasize is that by doing this, you are showing that you are taking that first step to take control, to get your finances in order, and to develop that financial integrity that we all need to have to make sure that we're operating uh, on a level that is you know, in alignment with our values and our beliefs. So I'm going to assume that your beliefs and values uh, align with the fact that you should have your finances in order and that you it is worth it to you to take the time to get this right so that you can go into retirement or even if you're not close to retirement, you can go to the next step of having things organized, prioritized, and really have a, um, a really nice, um, you know, really put together life when it comes to your finances. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so along the way here, uh, I do want to encourage you, if you're just uh, tuning in, to uh, if you have any questions about net worth statements or cash flow statements or budgeting or really any of these type of things, to go ahead and just put those in the comments now, and then I'll do my best to get to them along the way. And there was also a good question uh, in the group about you know dealing with some things uh, with around debt or mortgages and retirement, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit today too and answer one of those questions. I think that's a really good question. So. Hopefully you enjoy this, hopefully you find some value in this, and hopefully this inspires you to take this step and actually um, start working on your finances. So um, this should be a relatively short workshop, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's pull this up here. I'm gonna pull up an example here of a net worth statement that I put together here for um, an example for us. So uh, I just want you to think about your net worth statement as, as keeping things as simple as possible, right? Um, I don't want you to overwhelm yourself. I don't want you to get too much down a rabbit hole. Uh, what I want you to do is just get everything together, organized in one place. And this is a great example of you know what things um, could and should look like. So we're gonna go here sort of line by line and talk about um, how to get this set up. And you know you can honestly just copy this format. You know uh, if you haven't done this yet and you know you want to get this done and you want to get a net worth statement um, all together, uh, this is also known as a balance sheet you know, what, however you like to call it, um, it all works the same. It's basically a um, accountability for all of your assets and all of your liabilities. And for those that don't know, your net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. You put those two things together and um, 
then you are the result is your net worth okay so your numbers may look a whole lot bigger than this your numbers may look a whole lot smaller than this um, i made them on the bigger side because i wanted to add more to the um, accounts here so that we can get some different variation going on but uh, don't feel bad if you don't have two million dollars like this is showing here um, you know you could have a lot less than this and you can have a whole lot more but the concept the concept of a net worth statement is the same regardless of how much money you have okay so um, we're just going to go here line by line and uh, i would encourage you you know maybe you want to start with a spreadsheet like an excel sheet or maybe you want to start with just a um, you know a pen and paper you know and just getting a yellow pad out and getting these things all written down in one place and then you can once you get those things in order then you can transfer them to something a little more fancy like a spreadsheet like we're using here okay so what i usually like to do here is what i recommend for you to do is to start here across the top and start with your first column being the description okay whatever the assets are going to be you're going to start here in the first column that'll be the description of the assets so in this case, you can see here, we're gonna have cash. Uh, we're gonna have invested assets. We're gonna have other assets. And we're gonna have liabilities here down at the bottom, okay? Um, and then we're gonna have our other columns here, which is going to be related to who is the owner or who is on the title of those particular accounts or those particular assets, okay? So in this case, we're looking at Greg and Sandy, okay? So Greg and Sandy are a married couple. And um, we are going to be laying out the assets that are in Greg's name, the assets that are in Sandy's name. We're going to lay out their joint assets, and then we're going to have a total um, along the way. So again, you can literally just copy this. You know, you don't have to be fancy and do anything above and beyond this. This really summarizes um, the household assets for somebody that has a two million dollar net worth. So if uh, if we can do it with two million, we can do it with two hundred thousand, or twenty thousand, or even two thousand. So um, very simple. Again, we're going to have a column here for Greg. We're going to have a column here for Sandy, and then we're going to have a column for any joint assets, and then we're going to have our totals, okay? Um, so in this case, we start here with the cash assets. <clears throat> so we're going to start with a uh, joint bank account since they are a married couple. And in Greg and Sandy's case, we have the 125000 that they have sitting in cash. Uh, and since that's the only thing in this column, we have a total of one twenty-five dollars here uh, for the total and then a total cash again of 125 here so once you uh you'll notice here all of the assets will flow you know we'll start here kind of category by category person by person then they'll flow down to the bottom of each category and then they'll flow over here to the right to add up to the total here okay all right and so cash assets pretty simple we just have one bank account in this case if you have multiple bank accounts and you probably list those out separately uh if they're titled differently like in just either the you know the primary, so if it was like Greg here or the secondary, which would be Sandy, uh, then you would put those again under those particular categories, right? And then we're gonna move here to invested assets. So we're gonna have invested assets. So invested assets are really anything that is uh, not cash in this particular case. So if you have a 401k, if you have an IRA, Roth IRAs, um, Roth 401ks, brokerage accounts. It could be things like annuities. You know, those are all things that could be in this particular category as invested assets. But I, I like to keep invested assets separate from cash because uh, to me, that is a different category. And so I assign it a different section on the balance sheet, which I think is the appropriate thing to do. So in this case, as you'll see here, we start here with Greg's 401k. So Greg has a big fat 401k and he has about $800,000 in his 401k. Uh, as you'll see, this 800,000 here flows over to the right, matches up on the right side with the total. And then uh, Greg has a Roth IRA. And in his Roth IRA, he has $100,000. And again, that flows over here to the right. Then we have a joint brokerage account. Okay, so a brokerage account will be invested assets that are not considered retirement. Those are also known as taxable accounts. So this could be stocks, bonds, and mutual funds that are not in a retirement account. And in this case, it's under the joint category here, okay? So since this is a joint brokerage account, we're going to have a uh, joint um, placeholder there for 250000 which again flows over here to the right. So as you can start to see here, we have this 800000 here, 100000 here, 250000 here so far. Okay. And now we got to look at um, Sandy's assets. So Sandy has a 401k, uh, and that 401k has 450000 And again, here that flows over to the right to our total here to 450000 Sandy's Roth IRA has 120,000 in a Roth IRA, so that rolls over here. 
So if we go uh, column by column, we have a total of 900 for Greg. So as you can see here, 800 plus 100. We have a total of 570 for Sandy, so 450 plus 120. And then we have joint assets of 250 here and 250 here. So when we add all these columns up, we get a $1.72 million of total invested assets. Again, you know, there's a lot of people that have over a million dollars. There's a lot of people that don't. Uh, this is just meant to be an example. So if yours is a lot smaller, it's not a problem. It all ends up the same. But what you what I'd like you to do is to separate things out by who owns the accounts because this is important when it comes to um, things like uh, proper beneficiaries on accounts. So, you know, ideally, if you have an account that's only in your name, for example, in your Greg, well, you want to make sure your primary beneficiary is going to be your spouse, which would be Sandy in this case. Um, you might actually want to set up your beneficiaries in a way where Sandy gets part of the money and maybe your children get part of the money. But we have to start you know, going account by account to make sure we know how they're titled so then they can be um, have the appropriate beneficiaries assigned to them if something were to act, either happen to Greg or Sandy here. Okay, All right. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, and in this in this case here, we're going to now go down to other assets. And um, in in, this, in our case here, we have a primary home that's uh, an asset, and we have our 2007 or 18 Chevy Silverado. So Greg just got a new truck recently, uh, so that is um, going to be under his name. But the primary home here, as you can see, is going to be is worth $600,000 currently, which again is going to flow over here to our our total section. And then we have a 2018 Chevy Silverado. Uh, which is worth 15000 and that is, again, going to flow over here to our um, to our section, or excuse me, to our totals column. Uh, the way the accounts are titled are the, the car, uh, the truck is in Greg's name, worth $15,000, and the home is going to be joint, so that is in the joint column here. And so when we total those up for this particular um, section, the other assets, we get $615,000 of other assets that they're worth, okay? So everything we've talked about so far is assets, okay? And as I mentioned before, to calculate your net worth, you need to have your assets, and then you have to subtract your liabilities, okay? So in this case here, uh, we have two liabilities still out. We have a singly owned liability here for Greg. Greg still owes $12,000 on his truck, and uh, Greg and Sandy together own the home, and they have a joint mortgage, and the mortgage is still $200,000, okay? So when it comes to figuring out our net worth, uh, we want to make sure <clears throat> we're taking up all the assets, <clears throat> excuse me, here, 900,000 and 15,000, for example, and then we want to subtract the liabilities. So if we add up 900,000 for Greg, 15,000 for Greg, we get 915,000. But if we subtract the liability of $12,000 because he owes on the car still, now we're left with a $903,000 net worth that is titled under Greg's name only. And if we go to Sandy, uh, Sandy here has uh, $570,000 worth of total um, assets. Sandy has no solely owned liabilities, so we don't have to uh, consider anything here for her. So this $570,000, is going to go directly down here to our $570,000 net worth for um, that is only listed in Sandy's name. Okay, <clears throat> and now we're going to go to our joint category. We have uh, $125,000 in cash, plus uh, $250,000 of invested assets, plus a $600,000 home current value. But then we have a joint liability here of $200,000. So when we add up these top columns here and we subtract our $200,000 here, we get a joint net worth amount of 775,000. So when we add up uh, all the assets, or excuse me, the net worth that's in uh, Greg's name, the net worth that's in Sandy's name, plus the, the joint net worth here, we get a total net worth of two, $2,248,000 even, okay? So ending up even is not going to be, you know, the, the normal case, but, um, this is what it ends up in this particular uh, situation. So I want to pause for a minute here and see if there's any questions uh, before I move on to the next section here. Uh, Grace says, can we, review, can we review this in our next meeting? Sure, Grace, we can definitely do that. Um, that's the only question I'm seeing now. Let me take a look here and see if there's any other questions because I want to make sure you get this point. Uh, this point is so important that um, 
if you get this part wrong and you don't get your foundation right when it comes to getting your net worth calculated, um, and then we're going to talk about next, you know, your your retirement cash flow um, and your budget, you could really uh, be off trying to understand what you're going to need to cover your expenses in retirement. So um, I don't see any other questions coming in here, so I'm going to move on to the next subject. Okay, so let me pull up something here for you. Um, let's just take a look here at this particular subject. So um, something to consider is creating yourself a budget. Okay, and that's what we talked about last week is getting yourself a um, a budget together that's you know, is we can also call that a cash flow statement, but we want to add up and figure out exactly what your expenses are. So again, I, I think one of the best places you can start is just getting a yellow pad and paper out and just getting everything written down. But um, if you want to get a little fancier, a little more organized and just make things look a little cleaner, then you can use something like Excel. You know, Excel is, it is great. Um, and if you have Excel, Microsoft Excel, then they have these like free budget sheets you can use here. So I'm going to pull one of these up here so you can take a look. Okay, so here's a sheet that's, um, that is just one of the templates that you can get right out of Excel here. And it's pretty simple and straightforward to use. And I think it'll be a great place for you to start if you need to, um, if you like to get this stuff in order and start looking at what your, um, what your overall cash flow is expected to look like now and in retirement, okay? So you can fill some things out here like your name, you know, the month, the year that you're doing this for. Um, but the big items down here are what you really want to um, to look at and make sure that you have everything coming in, you know, well, uh, you, you know exactly what's going to be coming in and you know exactly what's going to be going out. So with this sheet, it's kind of nice. Again, this is just something I pulled out of Excel. I wanted to just do this with you and take the time to show you um, so that you can go back to this video and use it as a reference and make things real simple. So um, for most people, uh, for almost all people, I should say, we're all going to have a couple, you know, at least one source of income in retirement. So the, the primary source of income for most people in retirement that's a guaranteed income, that's not talking about investments or anything else, is going to be their Social Security. So you can you know just go in here, highlight this, and then just type in Social Security. If I can spell. Okay, so if you have Social Security income coming in, you can just fill that out, and let's say you're expecting, I don't know, $2,000 a month. Um, then you can put the projected is 2,000, the actual is 2,000, and that should all line up properly. You know, ideally, you don't want to have any variances over here on this side. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then if you have other incomes, like maybe you have a pension, right? You can have a pension and this amount looks right. Um, so this should all match up here. So again, this is these are really easy spreadsheets that you can just use to type in things and to keep everything organized. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, and then down here, um, once you understand, have your incomes all plugged in here, and if you have other income from a, any sort of side business or maybe it's annuity income or really anything else that you want to put in, then you just add it in this, in this column here. And if you need to add more columns, you just add more columns. And then this is the, going to be the key for um, the next step is to get your monthly expenses completely mapped out. So ideally, you have already gone through your bank statements and you've um, categorized everything, again, at least for the last few months, and gotten everything down to categories, right? So things like housing, groceries, your phone, um, electricity, water, sewer, trash, uh, cable, internet, maintenance, you know, and so forth. So these are some example categories in here. If you need to change any of them, you know, all you got to do is just highlight it and change it. So this could be, I don't know, let's just say gym. Um, okay. And you can just put that in there and then you can change the number to whatever you want. So I want you to start thinking about this and spend the time to get this in order because once you understand what your expenses are going to be and then how much your net worth is, how much assets and liabilities you have, now we can really start thinking about getting ready for retirement and start thinking about do we want to pay off our liabilities? You know, Do we want to pay off the car loan, for example? Do we want to pay off our house, for example? Um, and I'm going to talk about a question I saw recently um, in the group here. But you got to start making some decisions now to get yourself in a better uh, position for retirement. You know, because for example, let's say you uh, are looking at here your housing expense, and let's say you still have a mortgage before going into retirement. And let's say this mortgage in this case, you know, is $1,500. Well, you know, if you have a mortgage that's $1,500 versus a mortgage at zero, 
Well, if you look in this case here, you know, with, with these three incomes, we have $3,700. And if we look at our monthly expenses here that we're expected to pay, it's about 3603. So in this particular case, it's very, very tight. You know, we got about a hundred bucks difference, which actually this is not bad because um, with, with fixed income here, we're in this case, we're paying all of our expenses. Again, I didn't plan this out. It's just, these are the numbers that were in there. I just pulled this up, but you want to put in your numbers and take a look at how, how things are looking. Um, if all of your expenses all in are less than your fixed income, you know, uh, monthly amount you're going to be getting, well, that starts to look really good for retirement because if you have some assets saved up like 401ks or, you know, IRAs, well, that money can be used for other things like, you know, enjoying life a little bit, going on vacations and doing different things. But let's say, you know, in this case, let's say we didn't have a pension and now our income is $2,300 as it says here and our expenses are $3,600 as, as it says here. Well, now we have a cash flow de deficit of $1,303, okay? So it's not the end of the world. You know, this is going to be very common as well, very, very common. But now what we need to look at is we need to go to your um, investment accounts. And in this case, we need to make up about $1,300 per month from our investments. So these are the steps that we need to take to see exactly what our financial position is. And this is what I talk about living with financial integrity and understanding your financial position. And if we have a total cash flow deficit of $1,303 um, per month, which let me pull out my handy calculator here. You know, that's 15,636 per year. Well, now we know we're going to need to draw at least 15,636 per year to cover our base expenses. So now this is going to tell us, you know, uh, more information about how we should be thinking about investing. Um, you know, if we can actually lower our risk tolerance you know, or lower our, our equity portion that we have currently, or if we maybe need to increase our equity portion that we have currently because you're too conservative. But until we get these numbers in place, we can't really have that next step in conversation because we need to really get clear on what our numbers are and what the um, the cash flow needs going to need to be that we can um, that we're going to have to have to cover our our base level of expenses. So hopefully this was helpful for you and hopefully give you some insight. And this is really you know as much as I can step by step strategy with you without sitting down with you side by side to helping you do this. Um, so I'm going to go over now. It looks like there's a couple of questions here and discuss um, really anything you want to talk about. But <clears throat> let's discuss this a little bit here. All right. So let me turn off this distracting thing here. All right. So um, Sharon asked a really good question here. Okay. So Sharon said, how much is a good amount to have in cash? Okay. So um, this is sort of a, a wide question, Sharon. And, and I'm going to break this down a little bit and, and tell you why. <clears throat> You know, uh, the, the, the answer that I'm going to say is somewhere between three months of expenses and 24 months of expenses. OK, and the range is so being so wide is going to be dependent on where you're currently at in your life, situ in your lifetime uh, situation. So if you're still working and you're still in the process of saving and investing for retirement, you're not at retirement yet. Somewhere between three to six months is probably pretty good. Uh, this whole uh, COVID-19 has made me rethink that amount. Um, that you might want to be keeping more than six months because if we look at what's gone on with things being shut down, we're, you know, I think we're over the six month more, uh, point at this, uh, at this mark in the year, you might want to have more than this, but um, I don't think you should keep more than three months in cash. You know, you know excuse me, more than six months in cash. Um, if you have more than six months in cash and you're still, you know, early in your career, you have five or 10 years until you hit retirement, then you might want to keep other money that's liquid. So not in your retirement accounts where you might get penalized for taking it out but you could still put that into some, like a brokerage account, like I mentioned on the balance sheet. So that could be invested conservatively, um, you know, but not just sitting there in cash earning basically nothing, which is what it pays, you know, these days. Um, but if you're in retirement or like really close to retirement, you might want to uh, crank up that amount that you keep in cash because ideally, you know, when you're in retirement, we it's I find it more prudent to keep a little bit more cash or a little bit more um, safe money on hand, somewhere between 12 to 24 months at a minimum. Because if you look back at what ha what has happened in any of the, um, even the more recent or even, you know, the last 60, 70, 80 years of market downturns, uh, you know, the market downturns, let's talk about 2007, 2008 for a second. If you had a somewhat of a moderate portfolio, your portfolio returned back to even in somewhere between, you know, 17 to uh, 24 months, depending on how aggressive you were, depending on how much U.S. versus international, obviously, uh, your allocation there. 
but uh, somewhere between that range, 17 months, 20 months, somewhere in that range, you got back to even. So if you would have had two years worth of cash um, set aside for you to live off of, you never would have had to draw down on your accounts while they were down maybe 30, 40, or even you know more percent during that 2007, 2008 down, downturn. So that's why I like to emphasize having a little bit more cash if you're really close to retirement or in retirement, because that's going to take some of the stress off of your um, off your brain, I guess you could say, help you sleep a little bit easier because you know you have money there and you can ride things out. Uh, what we saw this year in February and March when we had the initial coronavirus dip, which was a very sharp dip and you know pretty deep, you know 30, 35 percent, and some of the asset classes like value stocks and small cap stocks still haven't really recovered um, fully. You know that was a sharp dip, but it did come back very quickly as well. So again, if you would have had you know cash to the side. Sure, it might have stressed you out to see your portfolio go down, but you wouldn't be forced to sell anything. And so that's why I like having some cash on hand so that you can avoid um, those situations. But if you're currently working, and I would actually ask you right now, you know, how secure do you think your job is? Because I think we're only really probably getting, it's still in the beginning of the turmoil we're going to experience when it comes to who keeps our job and who doesn't. <clears throat> I think right now, a lot of companies are asking themselves questions on, can I keep this many people virtual? Uh, can I keep this many people working from home? Uh, do I really need this many employees if um, you know everybody's working from home and I don't have to have as much office space? Uh, you know, and then then they're asking probably the same questions about their leases around their office spaces. So I think these, this next 12 to 24 months is going to be uh, still quite turbulent when it comes to different career fields. For those of you that are in the more of a service industry, so like restaurants, um, vacation type industries, so hotels, even like movie theaters, those type of industries, hospitality, you know, Disney just announced that they might have to do 28,000 layoffs here in Orange County because the state's refusing to open and let them open in a way that is considered safe. Uh, Disney World in Florida has already been open for a while and they've already have standards in place. So a lot of this question is gonna be revolving around where you're living and how the state or area or even county level, how it's being uh, treated when it comes to open thing, opening things back up currently. And again, this, this could happen in the future. Uh, we could have more flare-ups. We could have more shutdowns. <clears throat> and you could be like my lovely state of California here that keeps moving the ball down the field and changing the goalposts uh, when it comes to you know when we're going to open. Okay, They've already made three different changes on the standards are for us to reopen fully. So um, you know, again, depending on your states and depending on your situation, generally three to six months is good to have in cash, but up to 24 months if you are closer to retirement or, or in retirement may not be a bad idea with everything going on currently. So long, long answer, Sharon, but hopefully that was helpful for you on how I think about it and explain it. All right. So <clears throat> we got another good question here. All right. So Tamara asks a question here. Let me so the hardest part for me is the budget. We charge everything to two, uh, to two cards and pay it off each month but itemizing necessary versus preferred versus outside the normal month versus fun money has been a challenge. I wonder if this year is a true depiction. Hmm. <clears throat> so I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, and I think this is why, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of our, our broadcast today that I know this is going to be challenging for the first time. And to be honest, Tamara, um, you know, this year is probably going to be much different than the previous year and might even be different than next year because you might be spending a lot more time at home right now. You might be shopping on Amazon just for no reason because you're bored or you think you need things. Um, and you might be doing things like, uh, you know, doing a lot more home repair projects because you're just sitting around looking at the walls and looking and saying like, hey, this wall's ugly or hey, we should update this, you know, these pictures or maybe the, you know, we want to redo the deck outside and, um, you know, someone in your family wants to just redo that because they're bored sitting around all day. So I think this year, this year is a little bit unique in a sense uh, when we talk about <clears throat> these categories. But let's go back to um, let's go back to this sheet here because I think this will be helpful. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Let's go to this one. That's what I'm trying to pull up there. All right, it's not allowing me to pull up. Give me one second here. <clears throat> what I want to do is get things. Um, organized here for you <clears throat> to break this up a little bit more here. So let's, let me see if I can get this going. Let me shut this down for a second. And then we will go here and there we go. Okay. So 
when it comes to your monthly expenses, uh, Tamara, I think a good way to do it <coughs> is to start looking at things in a um, fixed versus variable. So I completely understand that um, you have a category here that you have, uh, you have multiple categories. So you have fixed, um, you have necessary versus preferred <clears throat> versus outside the month versus fund money, okay? So I'd like to consider that you break this down here in two categories. Let's just do fixed and variable, okay? I can't type today for the heck of me. Okay, variable and fix. Okay, so if you have fixed and variable, I think the biggest thing to start with <clears throat> is to get your fixed expenses, you know, in order. Okay, so in this case, we know we're going to spend, you know, fifteen hundred dollars on housing, right? That's not going to change. Um, groceries are pretty much generally going to be the same. Telephones going to be the same. Uh, electric's going to be the same. Water, cable, internet. These are all basically the same. Um, in this case, we have childcare, so you know that may or may not be something on there. And and gym again, these are all pretty much fixed expenses. Pets is another one, it's pretty much fixed. You got to buy the dog food or the cat food. Um, transportation, this is going to possibly vary a little bit because right now you might be working from home quite a bit more than you were previously. But again, generally, if you're if you're going to work every day, that's going to be you know pretty close to fixed. Um, in this case, it's cre it, we're using credit cards here, so credit card is probably where you need some help breaking this all down. Uh, but again, this will be your variable category. But so far, you know, all of this right here um, can can be in our fixed expenses. So we don't really have to update this a whole lot. <clears throat> we can just keep this, you know, basically what it is. Um, but if you have other categories that you need to bring in uh, and you have things like, uh, you know, just eating out, for example. You know, those are things that you need to um, keep track of. So. When it comes to how to look at this, <clears throat> where I start is I always want you to get your fixed expenses in, in order, okay? Because if we know your fixed expenses, this is the basic need that we have, right? As long as we can cover your housing, your groceries, your gas, your insurance, your cable, your internet, <clears throat> all these things that you're gonna need to have, regardless if you're if, if you're working or not, we can get at least a really good idea of, of where that is. Um, and then once we have the um, those that in place, then we can start looking at variable. And if you're having trouble um, getting this and keeping track of it, then I think you might just need to go old school, okay? Um, and what I mean by that is just doing something simple like taking out cash and using different envelopes, right? Us using different envelopes to categorize things that you're gonna spend in different areas. So for example, it, maybe you, you're gonna have some envelopes here and you're gonna keep these in your purse, okay? And maybe you have one for eating out um, you have one for fun. Uh, what else did you say here? Fun money. <clears throat> and then you can just put like, you can just put miscellaneous, you know, miscellaneous. So anything you want to spend it on. Um, and maybe you have a, you know, another category here for, you know, just things you like to do. So I don't know. Um, I've had somebody, uh, one of my clients before said they want to, you know, play golf as much as possible. So maybe you just have an envelope for golf and you put in a certain number for golf every single month. Um, it could be, you know, what do you like? What else you like to do? Um, eating out fun, miscellaneous. Um, I don't know. Let's say you want to go skeet shooting. I'm just making things up here. <laughs> okay. But I think the better way possibly for you, Tamara, to think about it would be to, to, since you're having trouble kind of getting control of it, I want you to just kind of flip this around. So I want you to flip this around. And let me go back to, the, to my main screen here. <clears throat> I want you to flip this around. So instead of swiping your credit card and then trying to figure it out, how much you're spending, I'd like you to go the other way. I'd like you to sit down. I'd like you to write out your expenses for the month. I'd like you to write out what you're projecting to spend on each of those categories. And then I'd like you to pull out the cash ahead of time and then put that cash in different envelopes and just keep those with you somewhere, either you know somewhere in your purse or your car, or whatever you'd like to do. And then only spend on those categories what is in those envelopes. And when those envelopes are gone, then you're done. And I think that will enable you to see that are your projections on track or did you go to eating out and you spend it all in the first week and now you have three more weeks of eating out that you want to do, but you don't have the money there for that. And so that's where you're losing money. And it's kind of a, like a like a hole in the side of your boat, right? Um, it's just a little leaky 
hole in the side of your boat that you have a you know a little bit of water draining out of or you're taking on water each month and that keep, helps you stay you know that keeps you off track i should say each month because you're not keeping track of those things so i would like you instead of just swiping your credit card and figuring it out i would like you to put the way put away the credit card for at least three months and do what i'm recommending for three months until you get a good handle on it and three months will be the minimum by the way um, i think it takes about 90 days to really get a good handle on your expenses and so by by planning ahead and being proactive and creating those categories, taking the cash out ahead of time, and then assigning that cash to, to different categories before you spend it, that's going to limit you from overspending or it's gonna help you be aware of where you are overspending because your envelopes run out before the month's over every single month. And vice versa, if you have extra money in certain envelopes at the end of the month, well then you have an option to roll that over or you can move it into a different envelope in a different category because you over plan for one area and maybe under plan for the other area. So just flip it around. Um, be proactive versus reactive is what it comes down to here. Create a plan, lay out your game plan, put the pieces in place, like I said, with the different categories and envelopes, and then stick to that. And then after 90 days, let's, let's reevaluate and see exactly where you're at so that you can figure out um, you know, what is really going on with your finances because if you don't, if you don't actually take control and, and become proactive with them, you're going to be reactive. And if you're always reactive, then you're basically cleaning up and trying to figure it out versus creating a plan and executing it. So, um, I'm a much bigger plan, a bigger fan of creating a plan and executing versus, you know, just doing things and hoping it works out. You know, at the end of the day. So, uh, hopefully that was helpful for you. All right, those are the only questions I'm seeing for today. So, um, ideally, folks, uh, I would like you to at least by the end of this week, uh, get your balance sheet in order, get your cash flow statement all mapped out, get a spreadsheet together, figure out how much you um, gonna need to, sp need to spend in each of these categories and figure out what's your what your uh, projected retirement spending need may be. Uh, and then once we have those numbers, then we can start to dig into thinking about, well, how are we gonna fund the rest of our retirement here, okay? so. Um, hopefully that was helpful for you. I'm going to wrap this up for today because, you know, again, I just want to, we're really going to go step by step here, break this stuff down, make sure you have it conceptually, and then I'm going to do my best, best to answer your questions. Um, and then we will go from there on that. Okay. So now I want, before I wrap up, actually, I, I need to talk about the subject um, that, what, that came up. So the question was, should I take money out of my IRA to pay my house off? Okay. So let's go back to our situation here because this I, this I think is a good question okay so let's look at our situation here so for our clients here for Greg and Sandy um, you know we have a two million dollar plus net worth but we're still sitting here with two hundred thousand dollars of a mortgage and a hundred twenty five thousand dollars excuse me um, we have twelve thousand dollars of a loan so we have you know, two hundred twelve thousand dollars in debt. So if you add up these two together here, you get two twelve. Um, but we have all these assets. So the question is, you know, should we, you know, take it out of our IRA, for example, or a four hundred one k, and just and just pay it off? <laughs> so there's some things here to think about. Okay. So in this case, we have a bit of a unique situation where we have a lot of cash. Okay. So you know, the first thing we want to look at is, well, how much cash do we have around? Because the challenge is if you were to take money out of here, like out of Greg's 401k to pay this off, well, now you're going to activate a bunch of taxes, right? So if you took a $200,000 from Greg's 401k, well, you might pay in a neighborhood of somewhere between 15 to 25% of that is going to go to taxes. So to pay $200,000 off, we need to take out maybe 230, maybe 250, somewhere in that range to pay off $200,000. So if your mortgage is at you know three percent, for example, which I believe in this case it is, well, does it make sense to pay fifty thousand dollars in taxes to save you know what six thousand dollars in the first year on the three percent mortgage? I would probably say no in that case that you you, you don't want to do that. But let's say um, let's say you're in early retirement, <clears throat> and let's say you have some cash here that you can live off of and you want to pay off your home at $200,000. And let's say in this case, you're married. Well, if we wanted to draw from, let's say Greg's 401k account, we know we're going to have to pay taxes. But one thing you may not be thinking, uh, remembering is uh, if you have no other income, 
you do have a standard deduction, okay? So your standard deduction is, I believe it's 12,400 for 2020. So you can take out almost $25,000 from this account and pay zero tax on it, right? And then, um, then if you were to go up to the to the ten percent bracket, you could take out up to about just under twenty thousand, it's nineteen thousand and change, and not pay more than ten percent, you know, on this particular withdrawal. So if you take the twenty five thousand plus about another twenty thousand, you can get out of this account and not go past the ten percent bracket. Well, now we're getting forty five thousand dollars out, and, and an effective rate of probably you know three or four percent. So if we're looking at three or four percent as our effective rate of tax, we're going to pay on this withdrawal, and we can get out fifty thousand dollars. Well, maybe in that first year, we want to take out fifty grand and pay this down to you know let's say one fifty. But you know, just taking out two hundred thousand straight out, well, we might pay thirty or forty thousand in taxes. So it doesn't quite make um, as much sense to do that. So to answer the question about should you just cl clear out your IRA to pay off your home, the first thing you want to look at is. How much in tax are you going to have to pay? What tax bracket are you going to be in? Um, and then is there a better strategy that if you were to pay it off over, let's say, three to five years, for example, that you would end up keeping more in taxes even after you pay the interest on the mortgage, then that starts to sound like a better plan. And then the other thing to look at is, you know, what's your interest rate on this mortgage? And if, it, if you're getting one of these interest rates I'm seeing now, like two and a half percent, you know, or three percent or less, well, you have to remember too, if your money is in your 401k, I'm, I'm hoping that it's invested. And if you just have somewhat of a balanced portfolio, you should be getting somewhere between five to 8% every year of return on this, which is tax deferred. So are you really losing money paying off, um, you know, not paying off this, this mortgage right here, if it's only at two and a half or 3%, you know, net, net, you, you, you might still be coming out ahead on your 401k money staying invested. You know, there, there are things um, you have to consider like, Hey, if you you still have this liability of the payment on the mortgage, that's something to consider. But if you're sitting here on, in this case, nine hundred thousand plus five seventy plus another two fifty, so you know we got one point seven in invested assets, another one hundred twenty five of cash. It's not really a big deal to leave this mortgage to sit for a few years and pay it off, so that we're not giving all our money away to taxes by taking one big chunk out at a time. So um, you really want to be strategic when it comes to looking at paying off big debts. Uh, you know, in this case, with twelve thousand bucks, yeah, I mean, we have one hundred twenty-five thousand in cash here. Uh, I'm going to say just knock out that twelve thousand dollar loan, most likely, because this is, I think, at three percent as well. But on a bigger amount, where we're, we're going to have to really draw out a big chunk of money from our retirement account, then we might want to second guess that. Um, if we took a zero off of this and the mortgage balance was twenty thousand instead of two hundred thousand, well, that changes the equation as well, and that changes how I look at it there as well. So, um, I really would want you to make sure that you are being smart, um, not only about, you know, the, the idea of getting your mortgage paid off, because I want you to get your mortgage paid off. I would love for you to be debt free, but if your mortgage is at two and a half percent and you're looking at paying, you know, 20 to 25% or more in taxes by taking all that money out at one time, then it may not make quite as much sense to do that all at once. You might want to pay it off, you know, at an, at an accelerated rate. Maybe you pay an extra 20, 30, $40,000 a year over five years but then you get it done as soon as possible and keep that extra money in your accounts growing and away from the IRS that you have to give it away in taxes by paying it off too early. So um, hopefully that was helpful for the person that asked that question. Uh, that's how I think about it. You want to optimize for um, looking at withdrawal uh, tax rate versus the interest rate you're paying on the debt and then find the happy medium there and create a game plan to pay off your debt that makes sense of everything and that balances that equation. Okay. So again, hopefully that was helpful for you. I'm going to wrap up for today. Uh, thanks again for watching. I appreciate you guys and we'll see you next week. Have a great afternoon and uh, please stay healthy. Please keep your hands clean and stay away from all this crazy stuff because COVID obviously has not gone away and um, we'll see you next week. All right. Bye-bye now.